Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second session in American English Live Series 12. We're so excited that each of you are here with us today. My name is Chris, and I'll be here with you today along with my colleague behind the scenes, Heather. We'll be serving as a moderator to help answer your questions and respond to your comments during the session. So throughout Series 12, we are exploring the theme of English for specific purposes, tourism and cultural exploration, 21st century skills, and the English language classroom, and teaching STEM to English language learners. We hope you'll be able to use the practical ideas we'll share. Are you eagerly awaiting for one of these sessions? Let us know in the chat. So here's what to expect today. The session will be about 60 minutes long. The presenter will present the material and I as your host will ask questions and make comments too. But we really hope to hear from you, our audience, so that we can address your ideas and experiences. Please do share your thoughts using the comments feature or chat box. And now for today's session, activate 21st century skills with board games in the classroom. 21st century skills are essential to student success beyond the English language classroom. One of the best ways to prepare students for real life in the real world is to immerse them in authentic situations that provide opportunities to develop language skills while also practicing collaboration, communication, critical thinking, and creativity. In this webinar, we will learn how playing board games in the classroom provides an opportunity to engage students of all ages in a collaborative or competitive effort that requires them to practice the persistence, productivity, flexibility, and leadership skills that will set them up for success in the 21st century. And now we are pleased to introduce our presenter, Jennifer Bork. Jennifer currently serves as the Education Program Coordinator at the U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants in Colchester, Vermont, where she coordinates English language and citizenship classes, technology training, and the volunteer tutoring program. Jennifer has spent the past 20 years in language education in both the United States and abroad. She has worked on language and cultural projects and facilitated teacher training in North Africa, the Middle East, Nepal, Vietnam, and France. Jennifer has a Master's of Arts in French from the University of Vermont in Colchester, Vermont, where she teaches in the graduate program and supervises student teachers. Jennifer's professional interests include digital literacy training, virtual cultural exchange, girls empowerment, and refugee education. Welcome, Jennifer. Thanks for that great introduction, Chris, and welcome to American English Live. I am Jennifer and I am super excited to be here to talk to you today about ways that we can use board games in the English language classroom. I think, as Chris mentioned, that one of the best ways that we can prepare students for life in the real world is to immerse them in authentic situations and give them opportunities to practice not just their language skills, but also to hone their skills in collaboration, communication, creative thinking, and critical thinking. And using board games in the classroom really provides an opportunity to immerse students in this collaborative or sometimes competitive effort that requires them to practice these same skills that will set them up for success in the 21st century workplace. Today, I really wanna start off with a story. I would like to tell you about my 16 year old son. This summer, he wanted to get a job. So he applied at the ice cream store to be an ice cream scooper and he had to have a job interview. And when he came home from his interview, I said to him, how did it go? And he said, well, it went okay, but they asked me a really strange question. And I said, what did they ask you? And he said, they asked me if I were a fruit, what would I be and why? I could only laugh because this reminds me of a game that I like to play in English class that comes from the American English Activate series. It's a game called About Me that asks players to answer questions or respond to prompts to describe themselves. So I thought today that we could start with a little warm up based on this about me game. My favorite prompt is the one right in the middle that you see circled that says one animal I want to be is because. So one animal I want to be is a dolphin because I think the underwater world is beautiful. 
I would love to hear from all of you. What's one animal you would like to be and why? Yeah, everybody, let us know in the chat box. What is one animal that you would like to be and why? What a great question. I love this game. All righty, we have uh, Wendy Gutierrez saying that she would like to be a cat to be independent. That's great, Wendy. We have M. Sill saying that uh, I would like to be a bird to fly around the world. We also have uh, Nancy also saying that she would like to be a bird so she can enjoy the natural world. And we have Salvador saying an eagle so he, he can have a clear view. And Jimena, an animal that I would like to be is a butterfly because they are beautiful and delicate. Ooh, and we have another one. Alexander said, I would like to be a dragon because it's powerful. And we have Erica saying, um, I would like to be a lion because it is brave. Wonderful, these are all great. Thanks for sharing those, Chris. I love listening to people's answers when we play this game because I find I learn so many interesting things about my colleagues. So hopefully that was fun and you learned something about the other participants in this session. Now I'd like for you to step back and think about why you might use a game like this in the classroom. Why would you use a game like this while you're teaching? Put your ideas in the chat again, please. Yeah, everybody, as Jennifer just said, take a step back and, and think, why would you use a game like this in the classroom? And uh, please uh, feel free to type in the chat and we'll, uh, we'll share out and uh, hopefully we'll mention your name. Okay, we have Daniela saying to get to know students better or to practice, to practice grammar structure, to develop their imagination. These are all great responses, Daniela, thank you. We have to test students' imagination and to practice, to build links among students and get to know each other better. All wonderful responses, yes. Yeah, keep them coming, everybody. Let us know why you would use this game in your classroom. We have someone saying to encourage students to carry on meaningful conversation, to have real life talk. Uh, Ludmila says for an icebreaker activity. We have Elif saying to make the topic more interesting. Jackson says uh, games help make the class very active. Um, we also have that this person says that they use games to catch their students' attention and to practice brainstorming in classes. Great. And, yeah, all great responses. I love all those responses and they really closely match a lot of the ideas that I came up with as well. Because games are motivating for students and they're fun, as we all know, students are really excited on game days. They're also great opportunities for skill practice. We can practice speaking, reading, writing, and listening, but we can also teach flexibility, cooperation, persistence, and communication. You came up with a great list. And I would say that they largely fall into two different categories. They fall into language skills and 21st century skills. And today we're here to talk about strategies to help us design lessons, really consciously design them to build both of these skill sets through board games. So let's talk about today's objectives. In today's workshop, participants will be able to identify language skills and 21st century skills that are gained through board game play. We'll be able to anticipate challenges of using board games in the classroom and plan for success. We'll be able to articulate the roles of the teacher and the students in the gaming classroom. And finally, we'll design and facilitate effective game-based lessons that encourage 21st century skill development with clearly defined measurable learning objectives. Let's take a look at just the flow of today's session. So with these objectives in mind, here's our plan. 
we're going to define 21st century skills because that's a phrase that we hear a lot, but we may not all be on the same page. So let's make sure we have a common definition. Then we're going to explore how to set students up to succeed in gameplay. We're going to examine how to emphasize 21st century skills when we're using games for learning. And then finally, we'll evaluate both language and 21st century skill objectives and consider some extension opportunities when we play games in the classroom. Let's get started by defining what 21st century skills means. What does that mean to you? I'd love to see your definitions in the chat. Yeah, everybody. Um, what are 21st century skills in your mind? Let us know in the chat and we'll see if you're on the right path. I bet you lots of you know, have some great ideas. Let's see, we have uh, Daniela saying management skills and social skills. I think of um, the communication, Jennifer, and a couple other things like that. Um, we've Great. got um, Sayin Kaya saying critical thinking skills. Um, we have a couple other people saying just creativity, emotional communication. Ooh, we have Helga Seti saying the four C's. Uh, Erica saying critical thinking, communication. Edison, research and social skills. These are all really great ideas. And for today, I'm just going to display a definition that shows you where I'm coming from today and it incorporates all of the ideas that you have all just listed. So today, when we talk about 21st century skills, we'll be talking about the knowledge, life skills, career skills, habits, and traits that are important to student success, to student success in today's world. Skills that are going to equip students to succeed in higher education, in the workforce, and in their adult lives. And you'll see at the bottom of the slide, the four C's that somebody mentioned. Communication, creativity, collaboration, and critical thinking are the areas that we'll focus on today. So games are a really useful and fun learning tool for learners of all ages, from kids up to adults. And the games that I show today can be modified to meet your students' needs and their interests and all of their different language levels. As we play a board game today, we're going to consider ways that we can use this game to build both language skills and 21st century skills. And without even looking at a specific game, as teachers, we can imagine the language skills that we'll practice. You can broadly summarize that, we can broadly summarize those with the box that you see on the left side of your screen. So we all know our language skills of speaking, listening, reading, and writing. We can build vocabulary, we can build grammar skills. These are all content skills that really make communication comprehensible. And then on the right side of the screen, you'll see 21st century skills, the four C's that we just talked about, which are really life skills to effectively help students communicate in authentic situations. Today, we're going to immerse ourselves in a board game. We're going to be the players so that we can look more closely at both of these skill sets and how they can be developed through play. Sometimes I'm going to ask you to wear a student hat and pretend to be a student. And other times I'll ask you to put on a teacher hat and reflect on one activity and use what you experienced as a student to craft some effective practices for employing board games in your own classroom. Today, the sample board game that I'm going to use is from the Activate Games for Learning American English collection. This is a downloadable collection of 11 different board games and instructions for the English language classroom. And these games offer opportunities for English, English, English language practice in a learner-centered and low-stress environment. You can see the link posted here in the chat. Um, so if you are interested in downloading any of these really easy to use games, you can simply do that and print out whatever you might be able to use for your classroom. And although I'm using Activate Games today to model this activity, the beauty of board games is that they can be used and adapted to any context. If you are in a situation where you don't have access to the internet or access to a printer, you can simply create a game template with a pen and a piece of paper. 
You might choose to use chalk on the pavement outside, or you could just create a giant human game board where students move around outdoors in the field instead of using game pieces. And you can also just leave your game board creation right up to students and let them develop their own games. There are so many different opportunities. And of course, we've all been teaching online for the last year, and you can recreate the board game experience for virtual classrooms. The game on the bottom right of this slide with a rainbow colored pathway is one that I created using flippity.net. I just inserted content questions and prompts from two different Activate games so students can play an interactive board game in breakout rooms when we have a Zoom class. It has all of the same prompts that they would find in the classroom. We're going to include the link to that in the chat as well in case you want to check that out and think about how you could use this tool to make online board games for your own students. I'm just going to give you a quick demo of what a flippity.net board game looks like. I've customized the one that you see here with questions from the About Me game and also the Name Your Favorite Activate game, which we'll look at a little bit later. Let's just watch. Here's a quick demo of what a flippity.net game would look like. I've just put Activate American English prompts and questions into this game for my students. And today we're going to play with two players, red and blue. To get started, students will simply roll the die and move forward on the game board. One, two, three, four, five. Then they'll click on the info circle in the top right corner and find their prompt. This one says move forward two spaces. So this student will continue one, two, and they'll choose a new prompt. Sometimes I try. Hmm. Sometimes I try new food because I like to be adventurous. And now player two will go. They'll roll the die, advance on the game board, one, two, three spaces, and reveal their prompt. Choose a card. This prompt means that the student will get to choose from the deck of cards with a question mark on it. Simply by clicking, they will find a prompt. What's your favorite place to spend a day? Hmm. My favorite place to spend a day is the beach because I love the sunshine and the feeling of sand between my toes. Students will continue this way throughout the game, progressing along the path from the start, all the way to the finish line at the black and white checkered flag. Okay, that's just one example of how you might create a virtual board, virtual board game. And now I'm going to show you just another simple way to convert your traditional board game to a virtual experience using a kind of any kind of slide sharing platform. You might use PowerPoint. In this example today, I've used Google Slides, but whatever works in your context is something you can use to share this with your students. In this scenario, groups are going to be assigned to a game board within the slide sharing platform and have the opportunity to choose shapes or icons as game pieces to move around the board. Let's see an example of how we can do this. So here's what you can do to create a virtual game board using Google Slides. You'll start in your slideshow just by going to background, choose an image, browse, and you can upload an image that you already have on your computer. Today, I'm going to use the Would You Rather game board. And once that's done, you'll see it appear on your slide. The next step is to go to the slide on the left and duplicate the slide as many times as you need to for the number of groups of students that you'll have playing the game. Let's imagine that we have five groups in this class. I'm going to assign each student group to one of these game boards. I can share the link with them and then they'll go to their game board, open it up and choose game pieces. They can do that by inserting shapes. Perhaps one student would like to be the heart, so we'll add a heart here and they can change the color, which is always fun. And then another student might like to be a sunshine. 
So we'll add them down here. And now these two students are ready to play the game. They'll stay on game board one, they'll move their shapes along the game board just like they did in the past game until they travel all the way from start to the finish line, completing a virtual game board in a really simple way. All right, so hopefully you can see that there are all different ways that you can use board games in your classroom, whether you're teaching online, whether you're teaching in a classroom, or whether you're teaching outdoors. They're really, really adaptable. So now let's talk about planning for success. As teachers, there are a lot of things that we can plan ahead for to support our students in having successful gaming experiences. To begin with, we we'll wanna take some time to activate students' background knowledge to see what they already know about board games. Then we'll want to model how to move from the start to the finish on the game board. And then next, we'll want to pre-teach any gaming language and also any thematic language students will need based on the topic of the game. Once we thought about the, the, the specific language that students will need to use in the game we're playing, we'll be able to develop some language learning objectives. Because remember, this is an educational experience. So we wanna make sure to connect their language learning to this game. Then before we set students free to start playing a game, we'll want to provide some really clear instructions so that they understand the task and also their language expectations. And finally, we'll want to prepare students to think about game pieces, dice alternatives, and the idea of turn-taking. So to begin, we can't assume that all students are going to come to the gaming table with the same experience with board games. Every country likely has their own version of a tabletop game or multiple games that they play, but it will be helpful to find out what students are familiar with before we get started. It's really important to build this background knowledge about the activity before we even begin. So put your student hat on for me. And I would love to hear what board games you are familiar with and what do you play in your country? You can type your answers in the chat. Yeah, everybody, let us know what uh, board games do you play in your country? We'd love to hear about it. Let us know in the chat box, please. I know one of my favorite board games to play is um, Backgammon, Jennifer. Um, we, see, we see someone saying that they like to play checkers. I always like to play chess as well. There's so many great board games to play. We have Beatrice saying she likes to play Chinese checkers. Wonderful. And Cepeda says apples to apples or apples versus apples. We have Nung Trin saying Monopoly or chess. We have Rosie from Bolivia saying chess and checkers. And Micah saying that we play Monopoly, Candyland, Chess and Checkers, and Christina Torres says uh, Serpents and Escales, or Snakes and Ladders. Fantastic. Those are all really great ideas, and they perfectly demonstrate my point, which is that we have dozens of different ideas about what board games might be from all of our different contexts and cultures. And some of you share the same background knowledge. A lot of you said chess and checkers, and that's played around the world. But Candyland and Apples to Apples may not be as familiar to everyone. So those are games that it may be important to build student background knowledge about. It's just important that after you have this conversation and you find out what your students know already about board games, that you set them in the context of the board game you'd like to use and give them some information and model about how you'll be playing in class. So I'm going to ask you to put your teacher hat on for a minute and just imagine that we are going to use this game called Name Your Favorite with our students. You can see the board on this slide. First, we're going to begin by showing students the start and finish spaces. Players begin in the lower left corner on the yellow let's rock start space and they finish at the yellow finish space on the top right side of the game board. We'll also want to demonstrate the path of the game. So students will follow the arrows up and down each row until they reach the finish line. And then finally, we'll also want to highlight any special spaces on the game board. 
This game board is pretty straightforward, but some games as the flippity net game you just saw have game spaces that might say lose a turn or draw a card or move ahead a few spaces. So we need to make sure that students are clear on what to do in each of those spots. Next, after modeling the board, we'll want to consider what vocabulary it will be important to teach students in order for them to be successful. What are some of your ideas? Based on what you know about gameplay and the board you just looked at, what vocabulary would you want to teach your students before beginning the game? Yeah, everybody, let us know what gaming vocabulary or gaming expressions or specific thematic vocabulary is important to teach before uh, students play the game. Um, let us know in the chat box. So maybe to pre-teach the game vocabulary. Um, yeah, lots of different uh, words. So um, someone says that, that it depends on the topic, Jennifer, on what the game is. That's a, that's a good response. Um, these games, we have got a comment saying uh, from Chetna saying that these games are amazing as this will help learners to initiate speaking and sharing their ideas with peers. That's a great comment. Um, some game phrases, Micah says to teach, uh, it's your turn, it's my turn, here's the dice. Um, Rossi Angie says prepositions. Daniela is just saying the terms dice and switch, choose, move up, move down, go straight, go left. Uh, Nung Trin saying different parts of speech, synonyms and antonyms callocations. Um, yeah, Amanda's commenting saying that we can use games to consolidate our knowledge and for reviews. What a great collection of ideas. Those really closely match the ideas that I came up with that you can see on the slide now. You'll see that there's all kinds of gaming vocabulary. I heard them that Chris was just saying from the comments, things like roll, your turn, my turn, draw a card, move a space. So these are all expressions that students will use for any board game. So they'll be useful um, gaming vocabulary. And then of course, there's thematic vocabulary. In the example I just used, the my favorite game, you would need to think about each of the themes that students need to talk about and teach the thematic vocabulary that comes up in advance. So students and teachers really need to look closely at the game board before they even play to think about the kind of language that they will need to be successful. Okay, with our teacher hats on, let's dive into one game and really reflect on its value as a teaching tool. We are going to use the game Name Your Favorite, which asks students to move around the board from start to finish while talking about their favorites in many different categories. Just take a minute to look at this game board and think about the language skills that students might practice in this game. So not the gaming skills, but really the language students need to talk about their favorites. Write some of your ideas in the chat. Yeah, everybody, let us know specifically what language skills might students need to practice in this game. And as Jennifer said, let us know in the chat box. We want to know what you're thinking. Yula says vocabulary building and vocabulary skills, speaking skills, listening skills. Thank you, Daniela and you, Yula. Speaking. Um, someone says it seems it could be just words for young learners or vocabulary. Or the phrase, what I like the most is, or grammar points, present simple, adjectives, vocabulary comparisons, opportunities for grammar skills. Yeah, lots of great to respond to everybody. These are great ideas. And I like that someone noted like skills for young learners. And I think one of the really neat things about this game is you can use it for students at all different levels. So if we look at some of the ideas I listed, I think you'll be able to see the different language levels that you might be able to include. As many of you pointed out, you can talk about thematic vocabulary. In this game, we have seasons, fruit, beverages, films and TV shows, books. There's all kinds of vocabulary students can use. We also need to express likes and dislikes. Students can express preferences and express reasoning with because clauses. So if you have a more advanced student, 
you wouldn't accept just the answer of my favorite is summer. You would really push them to say, why? Why is summer your favorite? Because. So we can also compare and contrast, as someone noticed, and we can practice all four language skills, reading, writing, speaking, and listening. So we can focus on different skills and different language levels, as well as different levels of confidence with our students with one single board game. So now still wearing our teacher hats, we are going to imagine our students and develop some relevant and measurable goals for this particular group. I'm gonna pause there for a second though. Chris, when I say measurable objectives or measurable goals, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think so, Jennifer, is that when you have these measurable objectives that what you want students to be able to do at the end of a lesson or at the end of a course? Exactly, something I'm setting a goal for them, but the measurable part means that I can actually see it. It's observable and I can track the change over time to make sure that they're making the progress that I want them to make. Super, so today we're going to imagine that we are playing this game with high level beginners who've been learning English together for one year. So knowing this about our audience is going to allow us to develop some really appropriate language learning objectives for them. We're gonna choose three specific objectives for today's lesson with this audience of first year English learners. So today students will be able to act accurately use gaming vocabulary to engage in play. They're also going to demonstrate mastery of their year one vocabulary while expressing likes and dislikes. And we are going to expect them to explain their reasoning with a simple because clause. So these are really observable objectives that will allow me or you or any other teacher to circulate around the room, engage the success of our students as they play. They're gonna be playing in a low stress environment with their peers and we can just make notes to ourselves about things that we might need to reteach or review in the future if we see that students need more support. These objectives are a teacher tool and now we need to really focus on how we're going to support students in achieving these objectives. As teachers, we really need to provide students with structure to support their success and deliver some of these measurable results. And we need to give them clear instructions and scaffolding that's going to empower them to succeed. So let's see what that will look like. To empower students to achieve the learning objectives that we've set, teachers need to provide scaffolding and structure to really get them started. And this includes communicating clear instructions, as you can see here, we're going to ask students to read the category out loud, say their favorite item in the category, and then explain why it's favorite. It's why it's their favorite. Next, I would suggest it's a good idea to model. For instance, I'm going to tell students, I'm gonna roll and say, oh, I just rolled a one. And I move forward one space onto the season space, which is in green. You'll see my red game piece there. And I'm going to think out loud. Hmm, season, summer. My favorite season is summer because I love to go to the beach. Thinking out loud is just a really good strategy to model how students might approach the same challenge in their own game. Then I'm gonna provide a sentence frame. I'm gonna write this on the board or I'm going to hang it on the wall somewhere. So students who need that additional support can come back to the sentence frame and see what it is that they need to do. So in this case, I put this on the board. My favorite season is summer because I love the sunshine and the beach. And then I'm gonna practice a few times with the group. We'll have a few students try it. We can practice together before I turn them out to do this independently. These steps will hopefully instill some confidence and give students enough structure to get them started on a path to success. Okay, yeah, we, so Ethan, we have a great ahead. comment, Jennifer, from Graciela saying that yes, scaffolding is very important. We definitely agree. Totally agree with that. And it really helps all students. So scaffolding is one of those things that you might think of it as a support for your lowest level learners, but in fact, it helps everyone in the classroom to be able to reinforce what it is that you're looking for. So now, even with excellent preparation and clear instructions and strategic modeling, there might still be some challenges when you use board games in the classroom, and you can probably imagine them. But honestly, these challenges create the opportunities that we are looking for to help students build 21st century skills. 
we need to anticipate these challenges so that our students might encounter and then consciously plan to use them as opportunities to grow. So as a teacher, what challenges might you anticipate when playing a board game in the classroom? I imagine many of you have experienced this before. So what are some of the most challenging things that happen? Yeah, everybody, let us know. What were some of the challenges that you faced when playing board games in the classroom? Amanda, yeah, time management. Group members might not be ready to share personal stuff depending on the game. You might have a large classroom or not enough space in a classroom or too big of a class size. A buzzing in the classroom, that sounds interesting. Or silence, on the other hand, maybe there's silence because students don't know the words or they're shy. Uh, Chetna is saying maybe impatient, they're not waiting their turn and there's some chaos in the classroom. Maybe a lack of cooperation between the students could be a problem. Uh, group members might be too shy or maybe there's bad technology if we're doing this game online. Um, maybe students aren't following uh, taking turns properly and they're not respecting the turn taking process. Students might not be familiar with the games, Maidana says. The management of the time might be difficult for the teams to handle. Um, Patricia says maybe students will revert back to their native language. Wow, I can tell that this group has had a lot of experience with games in the classroom and you're great at anticipating some of these challenges. It's really easy to see a lot of these challenges as negative, kind of like a gray storm cloud hanging over your classroom and overshadowing your teaching intentions. But it might help to try to think of all of these challenges as these raindrops that are coming down from the storm cloud because really this rain is essential to make things grow. And in our case, of course, we are not growing flowers, but we are trying to grow our students' 21st century skills. So this, develop, this skill development is really about building skills to thrive independently in the real world in challenging situations. So as teachers, sometimes that means, it means that we just need to step back and just let that rain fall down. We need to just release control and really let some real growth occur. And stepping away from that leadership role is not always easy and it can actually be kind of scary. You can probably imagine what would happen if you just go into your classroom and hand out game boards to students with no instructions at all. You would be concerned about this impending storm and that would be a good thing to worry about. In the same way though that we prepare students to communicate through language practice, we need to gradually release responsibility to our students to interact independently with their 21st century skills. And we provide structure for language success, and we can also provide structure to empower students to really thrive independently from us. My suggestion to you is really just to deliberately prepare for the rain. Provide enough structure to make your task clear, then step away and let it fall. Your job as a teacher is to not put up the umbrella, but really to just encourage the flowers to grow. So let's take a look at what this is going to look like in the classroom. Okay, we're gonna take the RAIN approach and we're gonna reframe challenges as opportunities to build 21st century skills through gameplay, which means that we're going to think of challenges as authentic situations that students are going to encounter outside the classroom. And we're preparing them to do that. We want to empower students with the four C's. We want to empower them to communicate, create, collaborate, and think critically, which means we're going to intentionally create situations that are going to require students to work together to solve problems. And we're also consciously going to allow space for students to take charge, and we're going to step back and let them take the lead. I recommend a solid pre-game plan before you go into this process. This is really going to help keep the, keep the chaos at bay and help you maybe organize your raindrops. You can think of this as preparing your garden. You don't just toss seeds out, into the, out of the window and hope that things grow, but you actually prepare the earth to support them. And we're gonna take the same approach with students in the classroom. 
What you see here is a sample of the plan I use when I introduce a new board game to my students. I present the game board and show students how to progress from start to finish. Then I make language objectives explicit. I'd actually put these on the board for students to see and we'll talk through them. Then we'll review the task expectations, give out clear directions and let students know what you expect. Then we'll highlight available supports. So there's that sentence frame that's on the board or on the wall. And next, I'm going to give students three getting started tasks. I'd like you to put your student hats back on and play with me for a minute. So first, I'd like you to imagine that I have assigned you to a group of four players and just handed your group a game board. Your first job as a small group is to identify game pieces. I haven't given you any. So what are you going to use? What objects are in your classroom that you might use as game pieces? I'd love to see your ideas in the chat. Yeah, everybody, let us know. Think about the different items that you have in your individual classrooms that might be available for students to use as game pieces and, and let us know. I'm really curious. I know I always had a, a pair of dice in my classroom, Jennifer, that I would use. Someone saying their students use an eraser as a game piece. We have someone saying using coins or buttons. Um, if you have small toys in the classroom, young learners, you can use those. Even just school supplies, pencils, books, markers, colored pencils, colored paper, um, yeah, any kind of coins or pens, any of your basic uh, classroom objects. Lots of great answers. Great, this is a creative group. You came up with a lot of really great ideas of things that you might just find around the classroom. Today, I have some candy sitting on my desk so students could use this as well. You said coins, you said paper clips, erasers, I said candy, maybe just a rock or a stone, a tack, anything that you find laying around. Students can use those as game pieces. Okay, put those game hats back on. Your next question is, when we are playing in a classroom, we don't always have dice available for students to roll when it's their turn. So what are some other ways to decide how many spaces you're going to move on a turn? As part of your small group, please give me some ideas about what you would do here. Yeah, everybody, let us know. What are some ways to decide how uh, students would go or how to move? That's great. We have like drawing straws. Let's see what other people are coming up with ways to decide on how many spaces to move. Yeah, we usually dice, but if we don't have dice, ooh, here's a good one from Edison. Um, the last digit of a page in a book, having students turn the page of a book and doing that by numbers. If you've got a coin, like I say, a coin or using a deck of cards with numbers. Nung Trin saying one, two, three, and take turns. Or kind of, I think that's counting off students as he goes first. Um, if you've got a spinner, Laurel saying, if you can make a spinning top too, or putting uh, writing numbers on a small piece of paper and then putting them in a bag and having students draw them out of the bag or a hat. That's a great, great response, Diana. Nancy is telling us um, by alphabetical order, by the student's alphabetical order name, or maybe by their birthday. Super, thank you for all of those ideas. And I have to say some of those are ones I've never heard before. I love the idea of flipping the page of the book and looking at the last digit. That's a brand new one for me. Another one I like, if you haven't seen it before, is using a pencil, which is actually a hexagon, and putting a number on each side of your pencil, and then letting students just roll it as a die and using it in the same way. I also heard cards, playing cards, 
And if you do download the Activate Game series, there's also a template so you, students can make their own paper die as well. So those are all some fantastic ideas. The final thing you'll want to think about in the or small group is deciding who will go first. And I'm going to give you a few examples of ways that students might decide to do this. So, hmm, whose turn is it to go first? This can get competitive sometimes. So maybe students will think about who's the oldest or who's the youngest, or maybe they'll go in alphabetical order or by birthday. There are lots of different options. They might flip a coin. And then of course, there is the old rock, paper, scissors game that seems to be used across the world. So students can reflect on a lot of different ways um, to choose who's going to go first in their game. So now let's put your teacher hats back on and we're going to reflect. So in deciding on game pieces and dice alternatives and in negotiating turn-taking options, let's think about the 21st century skills that we just used. As a player, you communicated, you had to be creative, coming up with all different kinds of ideas for your accessories for your game board, and you also collaborated with your small team. Let's think about how this experience really helps us deliberately develop some learning objectives for 21st century skills. Now I'm able to actually write some measurable learning objectives that demonstrate these. So you can see here, I've written students will be able to demonstrate creativity through development of game accessories. You saw that in action. They'll also be able to negotiate their turn taking behavior by, by deciding how they're going to take turns. And finally, they'll be able to collaborate with others to solve problems along the way. So just remember that with thoughtful planning and a release of control, we can actually give students enough space to develop their own structure and to problem solve. And you can see how if we step back from this leadership role and we empower students to develop these skills, they become the leaders in the classroom. If we had just handed out game pieces and dice and we had provided them with instructions on who, to go, who would go first and how to take turns, this really would have been a missed learning opportunity and missed valuable practice for all of our students. We can actually use this same reflective, reflective practice as we immerse ourselves in playing the game to thoughtfully plan for some teachable moments along the way to really support students in developing their 21st century skills. So let's put your student hats on one more time and join me in playing this Name Your Favorites game. Chris is gonna be playing for you today. Here are the only directions I'm going to give you. Take turns, follow the rules, and let me know when your group has finished. Afterwards, I'm going to ask you to put your teacher hat back on and to reflect on what you saw and consider how it might impact your teaching. Chris is gonna be playing for all of you today. Okay, Chris, are you ready? Yes, Jennifer, I'm ready, let's go. Uh, I'll roll first, okay? Okay. Oh yes, I got a three. Ooh, cold drink, hmm, my favorite. What's my favorite cold drink is lemonade because it refreshes me on a hot day. Oh, nice. I love lemonade too. Okay, it's my turn. I'm going to roll my pencil. I got a three as well. Oh, wow. We're on the same space. Oh, that's not okay. You should, uh, you should roll again. Hi, I disagree. I want to be able to answer this question too. Well, maybe, how about we come up with a compromise? Maybe you can stay there, but you can't say the same answer as me. Okay, that sounds fair. Okay, my favorite cold drink is also lemonade, but it's because I love all things that are sour. All right, audience, keep your student hats on for one more minute. We're going to move a little further into this game. Chris's game piece is going to move the, to the subject at school space, which is just two spaces away from the end. All right, Chris, go ahead and roll. Let's see if you can get to the finish line. Okay, here I go. I'm gonna roll. All righty, I got a six. Oh, that's too bad. You needed a two to get to the finish space. My turn. 
oh, wait, wait, that's not fair. I got a six. I should be, I should win. That puts me past the finish line. No, I disagree. You need to rule the exact number to win the game. Oh, well, Jennifer, I really don't like that rule. Let's ask the other groups what they are going to do at the end of the game. Maybe we can take a vote and decide on a rule. Okay, fine. That seems like a good idea. All right, so put your teacher hats back on. In this scenario, did you notice 21st century skills at work? What learning opportunities did you notice? Please put those in the chat. Yeah, everybody, let us know what 21st century skills and learning opportunities did you notice in this scenario between Jennifer and myself? Let us know. We've got communication, collaboration between participants. Lots of people saying communication and collaboration, coming to an agreement, negotiation skills. We communicated and then we worked as a team. Nung Trung says um, communication again and critical thinking. Hey, Marlon says um, communication and collaboration. Christina Torres says solving problems. Fantastic. You all came up with a lot of the same things that I noticed. I noticed flexibility, negotiation skills, dispute resolution, cooperation, and competition, and also lots of gaming vocabulary. So hopefully by immersing ourselves in that game, you're able to notice these learning opportunities, which prepares us as teachers to really better plan our teaching to highlight these kind of teachable moments and support students with both language and life skills that they're going to need to navigate challenges. So in looking at a game board, the potential language skills relevant to the theme of the game usually just jump out at us as English teachers and they guide our identification of language learning objectives and our pre-teaching needs. However, the opportunities for developing 21st century skills might not be as obvious on the surface. And playing through a game and thinking about it like a student really gives us a chance to think about teachable moments and how we might support students in thriving in similar situations. Having immersed ourselves in this game, now let's go back to our learning objectives and reevaluate based on what we've experienced. Let's see if we've hit the target. All right, so you can see the language objectives I set at the beginning here. And I noticed that there were opportunities to measure all three of them that we identified as we played. But I also decided to add an additional language objective based on what I saw in our game experience. You'll notice at the bottom, I've added in yellow, employ language of negotiation to resolve disagreements. This isn't something I had thought about upfront when I took a look at the game board. But I realized as we played, and as all of you noted, there was a lot of language of negotiation. So as a teacher, I'm gonna to wanna to go back and think about pre-teaching the language of negotiation. And you can see some examples of that language on the right-hand side of this slide. Next, I'm gonna do the same thing with 21st century learning objectives. I reviewed the 21st century skills objectives that we set at the beginning, and I thought all of our objectives were still relevant. But I also noticed that I hadn't seen a lot of opportunities for students to employ critical thinking skills in this game. These are really tasks that would require students to collect and examine information, to draw conclusions, make predictions, explain their reasoning with supporting evidence. I didn't really see that happening in this game. And I found myself wondering if there were ways that I could modify the game to really also highlight that skill. To make sure that my students are truly engaged, I really wanna push them to think critically. I decided, the way to solve this was to create an extension activity that I would ask students to collect information that they learned about their classmates so that they could make a prediction for the future. And on this side, you'll, you're going to see the task that I decided on. I asked students to record another player's answers throughout the game and then write a paragraph predicting where they might live in the future and what they will do for work based on what they learned about that other student's favorites. 
So they're going to need to synthesize information and make a prediction, which is critical thinking skills. And also, honestly, from a classroom management perspective, this activity also helps keep all students engaged in the game, even when it's not their turn, because they need to actively listen to other players' answers. It also provides opportunities for students to practice their note-taking skills and also their formal writing skills when they write a paragraph. But this is just one example. I've come up with a few other examples as well. We can take a quick look at those. So you might also encourage critical thinking by having students play the game using the least favorite prompt, but actually predicting the answers of their uh, fellow players based on what they've learned in the first round. Another idea would be to have students create additional spaces on the game board, adding their own questions and prompts. And finally, of course, there's the one we all love, which is having students work together with a partner, collaborate to create and design their own games. So many opportunities with language learning and 21st century skill building that can happen through board games. So to go back to our learning objectives today, hopefully you've seen that as a teacher, we hope to be able to identify language skills and 21st century skills gained through our board game play. We want to be able to anticipate challenges of using board games in the classroom and plan for success. We want to be able to articulate our own role as well as the role of students in the classroom with an emphasis on stepping back and letting students take the lead. And also we want to learn to design, extend, and really facilitate effective game-based lessons that encourage both language development and 21st century skill development with some really clearly defined measurable learning objectives. So we wanna consciously incorporate learning into our fun. And of course, we're doing all of this with the intention of empowering our students to thrive outside the classroom. Really this intentional planning and the willingness to kind of release control and step back is what empowers students to take the lead and gain authentic practice for these 21st century skills. They're going to that will carry them well beyond the classroom. So are you curious to know how my son's story ended? Remember, he went to that job interview and he got that strange question about what fruit would you be and why? Well, this is how it ended. I said to him, what happened when the interviewer asked you that question? And he said, well, I got kind of flustered and nervous. I definitely was not expecting that question. Then I calmed myself down and I tried to think quickly of a good answer. I didn't really think there was a correct answer. So I decided to try to think of something funny and to make them laugh. But then I also thought maybe I should try to think like an employer and figure out what they would want to hear from me as someone who has to work as part of a team, but also work well independently. And then I, it came to me, I had an idea. I said, I would be a great because I work well in a bunch, but I'm also good on my own. I just laugh and I was like, that's perfect. I think he figured it out. With that one question, this interviewer had tested my son's ability to stay calm in an unexpected situation and to think on his feet, quickly coming up with a solution to a problem. He tested his creativity. He evaluated his sense of humor. All of these are skills that any employer would look for in a strong employee. And the more opportunities that we as teachers can give our students to consciously build their 21st century skill muscles in the classroom, the easier it's going to be for them to transfer those skills to situations like these outside the classroom and in the marketplace and really set themselves on a path to success. So I'll leave you with this idea. If you were a fruit, what would you be and why? And thank you for attending today. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I loved your son's response to being a grape. That's amazing. And thank you, Jennifer, for sharing your great expertise in using board games to help students of all ages to develop these key 21st century skills. That was wonderful. We'd also like to, to thank you, our, our audience, for your great engagement and participation today. Please continue to share your ideas through social media or with your viewing groups after the session ends.